Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here and um, to see such a good balance of people from all over the world, but also of men and women. It's very encouraging. I wanted to begin by saying that I'm a political economist and I'm proud of the political part. And I want to be sure that you understand that all economics is political. The question to be asked is whose interests are served by, for example, an uh, 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 obsession with inflation? <laughs> whose interests are served by deflation? Whose interests are served by uh, macroeconomics that I'm going to discuss with you now? I want to be very clear about my, my position. My position is that the interests of the majority are what I care about, and in particular what we call labour. So I just want to be clear about that. Now I feel I slightly underestimated your fluency in English, and so I had very painstakingly written down as much as possible with little uh, hints and prompts and things. And actually, I can see that you're far more literate in English than I was expecting, uh, and I'm so impressed by that. Do we have a little um, flicker thing that I can flick, David? I have to go it from there. So I have to do it. So I do have to stand here. Oh, you can you can stand here and just just put the button here. No, no, it's okay. I'll stand here. Okay, so can you, you can see me, you can hear? So I want to start with this image. This is a man called Cecil John Rhodes, who colonized and occupied my country, South Africa, where I was born, and who, in my view, um, is of extreme relevance to what we're experiencing in the world today. And I'm not talking here about Palestine, and I'm not talking about... Um, the Killers of the Flower Moon, anybody watching that movie? About uh, the occupation of Red Indian lands in the United States. Um, I'm talking about the imbalances in the global economy. <clears throat> so, S Cecil John Rhodes uh, was a very wealthy financier, city of London, based in the city of London and built up, of course, a massive surplus and decided that he was going to invest that surplus in a country like South Africa, which was at that time unexplored, if you like. And he had, and others knew that South Africa had fantastic riches, fantastic riches of gold, diamonds, uranium, you name it, it's an extraordinarily rich country. <clears throat> And I have a certain bitterness about this because my ancestors sold their land to people like Cecil John Rhodes um, on the grounds that they thought they were getting a very good price for their land, but they didn't know that underneath the land that they ploughed on a daily basis was gold or diamonds. Um, and on the basis of that, um, the British colonizers were able to get very cheaply access to some incredible resources. Now the reason that I name him is because of a book by a man called J.A. Hobson who wrote about the causes of imperialism. And you may not think this is applicable, but let me just position this for you. So at a time of capital mobility under the gold standard, and the gold standard was a system, a global financial system designed to serve the interests in particular of the city of London, right? Creditors, financiers, people that provided money, savings, investment. So in a, in they insisted on a world of capital mobility, that their power to move their money across the world without any friction had to be fundamental to the gold standard, and it was. It was the first kind of globe, it was the first globalization from about 1870 to 1914. So in a world of capital mobility, Cecil John Rhodes could take his profits, his capital gains, and he could invest them abroad. And he chose to do that rather than to invest at home, right? So what emerged from this was a system in which at home, the British people, the British working people, had low incomes, low levels of investment, low levels of productivity and output. 
but the surplus that was extracted from the British economy was used to extract much greater reserves, much greater resources in countries like South Africa. Right. And so that uh, led to this imbalance where the 1%, the rich of the city of London, took the surplus created in that economy to invest abroad and not at home. And so we had a situation where the 99%, and I'm using this in very broad terms, of course, their incomes remained low. They remained relatively impoverished. The 1% were massively enriched by the power and the ability to invest in colonies like those in Africa. And Hobson worked this out. He understood that this was the system and he called it imperialism. And it's an incredibly important book. There were lots of weaknesses about J.A. Hobson and I'm not here to celebrate him. I'm here to simply say his thesis is as, as applicable today as it was then. So today the globalized system or the globalized order is designed on the terms that suit the 1%. It's shaped by offshore deregulated capital markets and animated not by public, productive, sustainable investment, but by private, speculative rent-seeking. So what um, Cecil John Rhodes wanted to do more than anything else was to extract an asset, call it gold, and to use that asset to extract rent from the wider global community. And this is exactly what has happened today. Um, the 1% want to get their hands on assets which will generate rent. They're far more interested in rent, uh, assets that generate rent, than they are in productive activity that may not generate rent. So this is 21st century frontier capitalism, which doesn't profit from labor, but makes capital gains from rent. And of course, the best capital gains to be made is from an asset we call debt, right? It's lending money. This is a fantastic asset. If you've got enough money to lend, you can charge interest on that, regard that interest as rent, and just endlessly keep collecting rent on the outstanding debt. And of course, if you have an obliging central bank, which allows you to set your market rates at any rate you choose because you're deciding on the level of risk of the loan, then you can make extraordinary capital gains from the rent that's obtained from debt. So both tangible and intangible assets are the things that are, are used now for capital for collecting rent and increasingly there's more rent to be made from intangible assets like uh, intellectual property, that sort of thing, than there is from tangible assets, real assets. So we live in a world where actually people are earning rent on that which we can't see or touch. So the deregulated and it's debt fueled thanks to the lax regulation of central bankers extraordinarily lax regulation, which by the way is the thing that led to the great financial crisis, which Mr. Trichet did not deal with the underlying causes of that crisis, but the deregulated debt fueled export-led growth model, of which Germany and China are the models, depresses wages at home while boosting the profits of exporters, which is exactly what Cecil John Rhodes did. Right. So we have a situation in Germany in particular, after the Hartz reforms, wages were oppressed, they were kept low. And the economy was oriented towards exports, exports to China. China similarly has repressed wages and has is, is reoriented her economy almost entirely towards exports. And, and living standards and incomes at home remain repressed. This is a problem for the Communist Party of China because it leads to restlessness amongst the people. And they're going to have to challenge it at some point. So the point is we have this situation where, as a matter of a model, the model of the global economy is to depress prices and uh, depress wages at home while enabling the 1% to export. 
Now the problem with that is that when all countries are exporting, we get a problem effectively of overproduction. So um, this, these imbalances lead to, of course, inequality, political tensions, and ultimately to trade wars. So there is this wonderful book by Michael Pettis and Matthew Klein, which is called Trade Wars or Class Wars, and it's based on the notion that inequality at home builds up and inequality at home and, and the, the export orientation of countries builds up trade wars, but they're actually really class wars. They're wars between the people at home whose wages are oppressed and the 1% who are able to export. So the result of the design of this model is the building up of a global kleptocracy. This is an extraordinary chart from the Federal Reserve, which shows the wealth of the top 1% versus the wealth of the bottom 50%. The bottom red, pink color is the, the majority, right? But the 1% have built up extraordinary level, in historic terms, extraordinary levels of wealth. In the meantime, for example, in Europe, real wages have been falling sharply. And now this is partly uh, about uh, this recent fall is post-COVID, but nevertheless, wages have, be have been, uh, over the last period, rising at levels below the rate of inflation. And in that sense, real wages have been falling or have been low in real terms. So this is a chart from the OECD showing you what has happened to wages between 22 and 23. And only in Belgium and the Netherlands have, raised, have wages risen positively. In places like France, they've fallen by minus 1.8% over that year, right? They're 1.8%. So we're having falling low wages while the 1% are doing very well. And we see this is happening right up to now. The 2024 Euro Area Report shows that nominal wage growth uh, across the Eurozone, this orange uh, line, is still below zero, right? So in, in real term, wages are still negative. And this is a chart from the uh, United Nations uh, Conference of Trade and Development showing that labor's share of the economy over the last 30, 40 years has fallen dramatically. So this is not surprising. So the global economic order serves the interests of wealth. Uh, and we can call it the billionaire economy. Uh, it was extraordinary to me that in 2020, the year of COVID, more super yachts were sale, sold or purchased than ever before in history. The, uh, the number of the sales of, of of super yachts is a, a measure of the extent to which the the one percent are benefiting. So the global financial crisis and the subs and subsequent economic decisions have been wrongly judged as the public living beyond the means of the economy. And the Greens, in particular, are keen to stress this: that we are over consuming that we are actually uh, spending more than we're earning, which might be true, we probably are, that this is a problem of overconsumption. Instead, I would argue that the economy has operated beyond the means of the public, right? So supply is excessive given deficient demand and not the other way around. So we have deficient demand. People don't have enough money to buy everything that the economy produces. So here's the thing, the wealthy who've got all the money spend only a tiny percentage of their income. Not enough to keep the economy churning around, churning over. Lower income people, on the other hand, spend almost everything they have which is falling, which is becoming very little. They spend it on housing, they spend it on food, they spend it on health, they spend it on education. You spend it on all of those things yourselves. So we spend our, all the income that we have. The wealthy only spend 1% maybe, or 10% of their income. The rest they're stashing away or hoarding. 
So most workers aren't earning nearly enough to buy what the economy is capable of producing. This leads to overproduction and underconsumption. And that's the very reverse of what everyone is arguing. So if we think we worry about the ecosystem, we should worry about the fact that the economy is geared towards overproduction and underconsumption. Now this is not an argument for us to keep up consumption with the rate of production, but it is to understand what's really going on. What's really happening is, what, uh, is a problem of overproduction, and we see it around. You see it in the gluts and the surpluses that you see in the stores. You see, I go into Boots Chemist and they want me to buy three bottles of shampoo for one. The, we, wherever you look, there are gluts and surpluses. Right, but the, the question of overproduction and underconsumption is a relative one. That there's overproduction relative to the ability to, to purchase or to consume. So that in turn leads to debt inflation because rather than too much purchasing power, chasing too few goods and services, and that's why there is such an inflation, uh, obsession with inflation because there's too much money chasing too few goods and services, I would argue the reverse. Too many goods and services are chasing too little purchasing power. So consumers take on debt to try to keep up their standard of living. They're borrowing money for a roof over their heads, they're borrowing money to go to university, they're borrowing money to pay for health. Right? And they become very indebted. And you know, when Mr. Trichet says that inflation is something that hurts the poor, uh, that is a bit of ideology. It is also true, and he touched on this, that inflation erodes the value of debt and is very helpful to people who are overly indebted. If you want to get rid of debt, you can inflate it away, uh, you, can erode, uh, you can pay it down, or you can default on it, right? Inflating it away, as they did in the 1970s, is a, is a painless way for the debtor of paying down the debt. And I speak as someone who took out a mortgage in the 1970s. And my wages were rising because unions were still strong, and my mortgage fell relatively. And today I sit on an asset in London that's incredibly valuable, because I borrowed money in the 1970s and very helpfully inflation eroded the value of that debt and maintained my living standards. So I feel sorry for people who live in a very low inflation environment. The only people to benefit from that are the creditors, the lenders. And all of economic policy, all of monetary policy is geared towards satisfying the interests of creditors. Anyway, so consumers take on debt to try to keep up a basic standard of living. And firms are under pressure because they can't sell all the stuff they've produced or that they have. And so again, they borrow to see themselves over uh, 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 and this is all uh, written up, this is in particular been revived. This is Hobson's theory, revived uh, recently by Matthew Klein and Michael Pettis. And Michael Pettis is very interesting because he's based in, at the Peking University in Beijing. So he lives in China, so he can see what China is doing with the clarity that many economists do not have. So like any country that saves more than it invests, China runs trade surpluses to absorb its excess production. And so does Germany. Germany has a trade, and Europe. Europe has a trade surplus with the rest of the world to absorb its excess production at home because consumers at home cannot purchase and consume that production. It has to be dumped on other markets. So the EU is as guilty of this as China and, and Germany individually. So as I say, this serves the interests of wealth and harms the ecosystem. And I put this up, I don't know who this woman is, Kylie, <laughs> Kylie Jenner Trevor Scott, do you know her? So the thing about her is that this is, a photo, this is a picture she put up on Instagram of her and her bloke because they're about to separate because they each have their own jet, their own private jets, right? So they're boasting to us about how they're saying goodbye to each other as they both get onto their separate jets. Which gets me to my next point, which is the richest 10% of humanity, and I have to include myself in that group, 
are responsible, 640 million people, for 52% of cumulative greenhouse gas emissions. The richest 1%, Kylie Jenner Travis, and she's, they account for 15% of cumulative emissions, right? And more than double the emissions of the poorest 50%, 3.1 billion people. So the top, the top 10 and the 11%, the top 10% are responsible for more than double the emissions of the poorest 50%. Based on consumption? Uh, <laughs> these are numbers which I've got from Oxfam and from others measuring these things. I'm not quite sure why, but I think it's perfectly obvious that people like me emit far more because I of my living standards and because where I live and because I also fly occasionally and I'm trying not to fly but I, I have always flown so you there are things sorry you come for a conference in Paris? I come for conference in Paris and I have enjoy all those luxuries so I'm part of that problem so this is why the one percent this is why the orientation of the whole global economy towards the interests of the one percent is so harmful to the ecosystem because they are the ones that are burning up our planet. So here are the cumulative emissions um, and the chart and you can look that up. And as we can see, there's been absolutely no halt in the rise of emissions, despite all the panicky talk about global warming. The system is so clearly and deeply embedded that it isn't really able to change. So we see the United States just zooming ahead of everybody else, but the European Union is not far behind. China is catching up, but China is simply the outsourcing of our production and consumption. So we, you know, we may as well add that up to those two. And then, of course, there's the United Kingdom boasts that it's leveling out. Well, we'll see. So, we, ha we face a choice. What are we going to do about the ecosystem? Because the task is major. It's, tr it's transformative. It's about transforming the whole economy. It's about transforming the whole system. It's about saving nature in order f our life support system, our spaceship, as Mr. Trichet called it. And that's going to cost money. You know, we're going to have to wind down the... Um, the coal and the oil extraction industries. We're going to have to do something for the people who work in those industries. We're going to compensate them for losses. We're going to have to compensate the shareholders, for God's sake, in those industries. Now, I speak with feeling about this. I'm an advisor to the Scottish Government on the Just Transition Commission that the Scottish Government has set up for dis discussing and for pre planning the transition away from their dependence on fossil fuels. And as you know, Scotland has Aberdeen, which is the oil capital of Europe virtually, right? It's, and, and we have on the commission, we have the oil companies, we have environmentalists, we have policy makers, and we have the trade unions representing the oil rig workers. And they're saying to us, what are you gonna do? You, yeah, I'm going to lose my job. I'm earning, I don't know, 120,000 a year as an oil rig worker. What's going to happen to my job and to my livelihood, to my family, blah? These are real questions we're going to have to face. And they, it's going to cost money to make that transition happen, to compensate workers, to compensate the oil companies, for goodness sake. Um, we're going to have to force them into change, but in order to do so, we're going to have to manage it and finance it. Where are we going to get the money from? I hope we can have that discussion because it's my favourite discussion, but, but it's also my obsession. So let's leave this for a moment. So the thing that we have to decide is, do we keep a small green state, which is what, if you like, the neoliberal uh, ideology demands of us, this is what the 1% want. They want us not to crowd out the private sector. So we need to narrow the public sector so the private sector can do it all and can do it without hindrance. We can choose that framework or we can use, choose rather to have a large green entrepreneurial, to quote Professor Mariana Matsukato, risk-taking state. I'm always... And I, I don't know how many of you have read Mariana Matsukato, 
but she's written about the Apple phone, for example, and about GPS, which was invented inside the public sector by the defense. Only the Ministry of Defense of the United States was willing to take the risk and the investment needed to generate those sorts of innovations. The private sector is profoundly risk averse, right? The, pr the private sector does not want to have to face market discipline. The private sector wants the state to de-risk their investment and their activities. It's really rather blatant, especially as they all con you know, uh, conduct themselves as Adam Smith advocates and so on. So we need to think about what we want. And I, I mean, my view is we need the big green state to tackle the crisis of uh, transformation. And in the process to stimulate private investment and activity. The fact of the matter is, you know, the, the British government was building a big railway line, HS2, north to south, south to north. And the, the, the British government uh, mobilized the investment for that railway line. But the contractors, the people that did the work of building the railway line, were all in the private sector. They needed the state to take the risk of saying we're going to invest in this railway line so that they could get the contracts to build the railway line, right? And they want that, they want the state to back it because that's the best kind of investment from their perspective. It's not risky. So that's the good thing about the green state and, the role, and its role to the private sector. But the, the Wall Street consensus, as things stand at the moment, is that de-risking should happen. That investors like BlackRock. Now, BlackRock has mobilized, I don't know how many trillions of dollars it manages now, but I think it's in excess of $9 trillion. When I last looked, it was $9 trillion, but I think it's closer now to $10 trillion. They've mobilized our savings from the time we privatized our pension arrangements in the West, and we privatize these pensions and everybody's savings gets channeled up to companies like BlackRock, asset management funds. So they take our savings and then they invest those savings and they do have a, a, a challenge. They have to return pensioners wages for 30 years in the future. So this is a big challenge facing um, uh, asset management funds. But they will not take, they will not make risky investments without public sector guarantees, without public sector subsidies, without public sector protection from market forces, right? So the question is, are we willing to do that or do we want to actually do it all ourselves? So they cannot address the crisis of fossil capitalism and its associated macro financial pressures without public sector guarantees. And their current policies are not fit for managing macro financial crises, especially the climate crises. And these policies are central bank monetary dominance or independence. Now, <coughs> I listened to Mr. Trichet and it pained me really because he never spoke at all as if he was part of a system which include, includes fiscal policy. All central banks are actually extensions of government departments. They're politically appointed. They're not, you know, they're not just technocrats. They're very political appointments. And they are civil servants. They're paid for by the state, right? And yet they don't see themselves as working with and for the state. They're very proud of it. And this, of course, is because the, the, the private finance sector said no. The central bank should be here to operate in the interests of private capital. And it does. This obsession with inflation is because central banks are concerned to maintain the assets and the values of the creditors, the creditor class. And so they have to be independent of the state because they have to bail out the finance sector as they did in 2007-9 and as they did in 2020 during COVID. They have to be there to protect the free market uh, Wall Street, basically, system. And I, I think that's a problem. 
that's something we have to challenge because they're not independent, they're civil servants and they are, um, they are appoint political appointments. I'm very interested because I heard what Mr. Trichet was saying about mandates. The Federal Reserve of the United States has two mandates, one that was issued in 1946 and one that was issued in 1978, Humphrey Hawkins, and I recommend you go and look at it. Humphrey Hawkins said that they had to worry about inflation, they had to worry about employment, and they had to worry about keeping rates low. But above all, they had to have fiscal and monetary coordination. This is embedded in 1978, that is. It's not, it's not Bretton Woods, it's 78. So this is under Jimmy Carter. Of course, Paul Volcker immediately dismissed this legislation and this mandate, but it is a congressional mandate and it is still there. And what I'm calling for is just simply that we honour the 1978 Humphrey Hawkins bill, um, because that is the mandate for the Federal Reserve. And if the Federal Reserve were to honour their mandate, you can be sure the Bank of England and the ECB would do the same, because the Bank of England and ECB just follow in there. The, the tracks of the uh, Federal Reserve. So we have a we have a so-called central bank independent and we have a lack of fiscal and monetary coordination and that's crazy. It's crazy. It's really important. You know, right now the, the state is managing a crisis, the crisis of the war in Ukraine, Covid, supply chain problems, all kinds of crises and at this point the central banks decide to raise interest rates. They also, have a, 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 they also have a crisis of debt, which is a consequence of the great financial crisis. This led to huge imbalances in fiscal policy because governments had to support their, their economies and they were forced to do so. So they've got these high levels of debt, at which point the central bank decides to ratchet up interest rates and thereby increase the cost of debt for the state. Did you want to ask something? Say that again. Not just the war in Ukraine, but also the war in Gaza. Don't worry, the war in Gaza is my preoccupation, and I'm sorry if I didn't sound like that is one of the crises we are facing. But the, the go Western governments don't behave as if it's a big crisis for the Western governments. So this lack of fiscal and monetary coordination means that the, the central bank goes in one direction and government fiscal policy goes in another direction. Who suffers? The people suffer. So then my third point is the, the, the reason why we cannot have the, um, address the ecosystem crisis is because of full capital mobility. Um, we've got to alter that. We cannot have full capital mobility because no government can manage the economy in the presence of capital mobility. It's not possible to manage the exchange rate. It's not possible to manage interest rates. It's not possible to manage the key levers of the economy that you need to satisfy the needs and interests of your population. Right? And that is in a sense what the ideology was set out to do. It was to detach governments from the interests of their population. So we see now the alienation of governments from populations and with that we see the rise of fascism, essentially. We see why, and Mr. Trichet had the honesty to face this, why people turn to Donald Trump. They turn to Donald Trump because their wages were falling in real terms, because they were losing jobs, and because the 1% were having a wonderful time. And they're mad as hell about that. And Mr. Trump said, come to me and I will look after you. I will build a wall against Mexico. I'll build a wall against, I'll go to war with China. I'll do everything to protect American working class interests. And they voted for, and they will vote for him again. And they will vote for the far right in Europe for the same reason which is that the interests of the 1% are looked after by the central banks, but the interests of the 99% are neglected in favour of the 1%. And, and so if governments are to pay attention to the interests of their people, they cannot do that in a world of capital mobility. So I leave that point. Then there's market-based finance. I mean, first of all, oh, <laughs> I don't know where to start on the question of 
the financial system and the understanding of money because there is virtually no understanding of the nature of money as things are today. We still, we still think of money as a commodity. We still think of it as something that we can save and we can hoard. We still think of it as someone thing that someone who's very rich can have loads of and that the rest of us can't have access to. And that's not what money is. Money has evolved. We as a civilization have evolved money to be a thing, a social construct. It's not a commodity. It's a thing. It's a belief. It's, it's a promise. It's a social arrangement, promise to pay, right? To enable us to do the things we can do. And that's what's so wonderful about money. It's that it, we invented a system which enabled us to, initially we had barter. All we had was barter. I've got a chicken and you've got a, a half a pig, you know, let's do a deal. It was as primitive as that. And then we invented a, f a framework and a thing that enabled us to do what we can do. And we called it money. And we've taken that thing and we've turned it into a commodity and we've fetishized it and we're now hoarding it and it's not there for use for the thing that we need. We need to tackle the ecosystem. We need the money, the finance to do that, but it's not, it's hoarded away, it's separated away from us. And where it is at the moment is in the stratosphere. So there's something called market-based finance or shadow banking. So thanks to the lax regulation of central bankers, the, the, the financial sector has detached itself from the, from the state. It's detached itself from the economy. It operates out there in the stratosphere without any regulation or oversight. That was the ambition of the neoliberals and they've achieved it. And so we have something like, um, where is it? This is, this is a report by the Financial Stability Board of the world's financial assets. And they don't like the term shadow banking. They find it offensive. So they call it non-bank financial intermediation, right? And here are the, are the numbers. The world's total financial assets are about 461 trillion. The non-bank financial intermediation crowd have got $217.9 trillion. The OFIs, which are... Um, which are things like um, pension funds and insurance corporations and so on, have a little less. And then there's uh, the narrow me measure of NBFI. So the point of the matter is, the uh, reason I'm using these numbers to show you is to just give you a sense of the scale of money that there is out there. With $217 trillion, we could help those guys who are... Um, who are working on oil rigs in the North Sea. We could finance the transformation of our economies away from the dependence on fossil fuels. There's loads of money out there, but at the moment it's up in the stratosphere and it's being speculated with by, by private people. We don't know who they are, what they do. We don't know how they speculate with it. It tends to be fairly secretive. It's my money, my pensions. The biggest fear I have for the next financial crisis is that pension funds will collapse and will fail. And the world is full of old people and getting older who are not going to have income in their old age. And there is going to be, well, at that point, God knows what we're going to face, right? Because our pensions are out there. We don't know what they're doing. They're gambling with them, essentially. And it's a tough gamble. I wouldn't have, want to have that responsibility myself. But gee, you know, this is our future. Anyway, there's loads of money. The question is, what are we doing with it? So, um, so yes, yeah, so current policies are not fit for... Sorry about this. Um, I wanted to just, just give this quote from Greenspan, who said very smugly before the great financial crisis, Thanks to globalization, policy decisions in the United States have been largely replaced by global market forces. National security aside, it hardly makes any difference who will be the next president. The world is governed by market forces. 
Now that should terrify us. That is where the roots of fascism lie. Sorry, we can't look after you or your job or your family or your health or your safety or your security. That's for the market. The market will do that. And Karl Polanyi, how many people here have read Karl Polanyi? Well, as Karl Polanyi warned us in 1944, what happened when, when the people of Germany felt that they were subject to market forces beyond the control of themselves, but also beyond the control of their elected representatives, they turned to a strong man, Hitler, to protect them from market forces. So, you know, it really is terrifying when someone as powerful as Greenspan was in his day to say this with such complacency. Right, so the Green New Deal. So I'm co-author of something called the Green New Deal. Back in 2007, at the height of the crisis, a group of us, economists and environmentalists, got together and we drafted a report called the Green New Deal. It didn't go very far. A few European Greens picked it up. A few American Greens picked it up, but on the whole it was a dead duck. And then in 2018, someone, a man, young man knocked on my door and he was a member of the Justice Democrats in the United States and they had a candidate in New York they were putting up called Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, but they didn't have any policies for her. Did we have it? Could we help? So we said, oh, there's something called the Green New Deal. So AOC picked up on the Green New Deal and ran with it and therefore it became famous for a moment. But uh, it's, it's gone out of fashion again. So the Green New Deal is the alternative. It moves governance of the global economy away from Wall Street, because let's not piss around here. Wall Street runs the world, essentially. Um, it moves it away from Wall Street and empowers democratic states, or states even. It's achieved by the removal of private authority over key levers of the economy, exchange rates, interest rates, and capital flows, and restoration of public, call it democratic authority, over the international financial system or architecture, through management of cross-border capital flows, which brings offshore capital, this is Cecil John Rhodes's capital, back on shore uh, for, to invest in the economy at home. So, um, by moving governance of the economy away from Wall Street and so on, yes. So, so the alternative, so after nearly 40 years of monetary dominance and central bank independence, central banks and ministries of finance will instead work in tandem again to serve the interests of society and the planet, not capital markets. Both monetary and fiscal policy deployed to finance massive green public investment. Both uh, uh, Keynes, because Keynes actually said, anything we can actually do, we can afford. I'm right now because I'm from South Africa and because I follow these things closely, I'm very conscious at the moment of the ambitions of southern countries to detach themselves from the dollar and to, um, to replace the dollar with another currency. And at the moment, the ideas are that, we should, that they should move towards the renminbi, the Chinese currency. Now, I'm terribly against that because it's like replacing one hegemon with another hegemon, right? That's not going to solve the problem. The problem is much deeper than that. So I'm busy with a, a group of other economists thinking about re, uh, in re, uh, reasserting the role of an international clearing union. But the really important thing about the international clearing union was that it was a system for clearing balances between countries, countries in surplus and countries in deficit, who want to trade with each other. It, had its, it was reflected, for example, in the European Payments Union, which very few people know about, but I recommend you read about it, which was set up in the 1950s. Um, and this, and, but in studying the clearing union and the European Payments Union, I'm forced back to understanding Keynes's point about money. So he proposed that, that, that because in the 1930s there were massive imbalances between countries, countries with surpluses and countries with deficits, which led to 
political tensions which led to trade wars, he was determined that th those imbalances should be corrected. Now today we have terrible imbalances. We have China's massive surplus. We have the United States' massive deficit. We have Europe's uh, surplus. We have Britain's deficit. We have imbalances within Europe, right? These imbalances are dangerous. So what he wanted to do was to discourage those sorts of imbalances by having a clearing union where people would import and export to each other. Countries would import and export to each other. And he proposed to set it up. And all that would happen is uh, countries would have bank accounts with the, with, the, with the bank at the centre of it, called the International Clearing Union Bank, which, and they would have a currency. And they would be entitled to 15% of their trade uh, uh, gains in that year as a basis of an overdraft, if you like, with the, with the uh, International Clearing Union. But what Keynes was very clear about was that he could set up this bank and get people to trade with each other without any money whatsoever. Nobody would have to put down a deposit. Nobody would have to collect capital. They wouldn't have to have a load of money to enable them to trade. All they would have to have was the ability to trade, to export or to import. And then there were rules that you couldn't just export, you had to also import in order to maintain balance between countries. And if you, d if you built up a surplus, you were penalised with very high interest rates on your surplus. Also, if you built up a deficit, you were penalised. The United States would be penalised right now. But what was so striking about it is that he understood you didn't need money to make it possible for the world to trade. You didn't need money for that. Because what would happen was you'd want to trade, but you wouldn't have enough money to buy the American goods. And so the bank would give you an overdraft. When you get an overdraft from a bank, it isn't money in that sense. It's a promise to pay in the future. That's all it is. And that's what money is. It's a promise to pay in the future, right? And Keynes argued, well, you, that's all you needed. So you would, you would get an overdraft, and you would then have to correct your, uh, you'd have to pay down your overdraft, which means you'd have to export enough to be able to pay down your overdraft, right? But also, if you had a surplus, you would get punished, you would lose money. So you'd have to import in order to, to balance the thing. But the striking thing is that, because fundamental to the International Clearing Union was Keynes' understanding of money. Money is the thing that enables us to do what we can do. It's not something like gold which you can hoard in the bank. It's not something, it, could, it should not be something like gold that you hoard in the bank, right? It is something that facilitates our transactions, that enables us to do what we can do. We've lost that understanding of money. And I was listening to Mr. Trichet, and it's not an understanding that he has. He thinks money is gold. He thinks money is a commodity. He thinks you've got to have enough of it in the bank in order to blah, anyway, in order to do anything. Uh, and that's a problem. So the next thing we have to do is to require the central bank to develop a public taxonomy of green and brown assets or collateral. Now the key thing about, that we need to remember about the central bank is that it, uh, and governments, is that it issues an asset called debt, right? And it's an asset which we have learned to treat with contempt. It's a bad thing. It's a horrible thing because Britain has so much debt. And, but on the other hand, for the finance sector, public debt is one of the most valuable assets in the world. Why? Because it generates rent. I lend money to the British government. The British government has never defaulted on its, on its um, lending, on its borrowing. Furthermore, the British government has behind it something like 30, 35 million taxpayers who by law pay taxes every year, every month, and so on, every day when they go shopping. And that revenue comes into the treasury and the treasury backs up the central bank. So if I were Malawi and I issued a bond, 
the bond wouldn't be worth very much because I don't trust the government of Malawi to pay back its debts because it's very poor and it doesn't have resources. It can scarcely grow enough food to feed its people and it certainly does have gold and silver and so on. So I don't value that collateral, but I do value European Central Bank collateral or British government collateral or American collateral, which is the most valuable of all. So we think of public debt as, as a kind of a sin, an economic sin, and Wall Street thinks of public debt as the most valuable collateral they can get their hands on because it generates rent, but it also enables them to exchange that collateral for new cash and so on, which they do in the shadow banking market. So what we're going to argue for is that in future central banks should determine which assets and which collateral that are left with the central bank are brown and which are green. And, we sh and the central bank should, should not purchase brown assets, should not give brown, brown assets um, uh, the recognition and the credibility that they would get by lodging those assets with the central bank. And this would, so we should penalise brown. So, the ECB to stop buying brown assets, purchase green assets and, and renewable sectors give them value. And this central bank strategy would significantly reduce the climate footprint of the ECB corporate QE and would align companies' access to finance with Paris Agreement targets. It would mean developing public institutional capacity to rapidly steer the private sector towards low carbon activities. So this is where the state could play a role in driving the private sector into green activity. So we need to transform the globalised system from the, for the 1% to what President Biden has called a shift from wealth to work, a rebalancing of economic power from the global wealthy few to what the TUC, the Trade Union uh, Congress in, United, in Britain calls the hard-pressed many. We need to restore economic power over trade, interest rates, investment to democratic accountable governments. And as Keynes said, it's a complete mistake to believe that there is a dilemma between scheme, schemes for increasing employment and schemes for balancing the budget. That's a lesson Europe should really learn right now. There is no possibility of balancing the budget except by increasing the national income, which is much the same thing as increasing employment. The economic policies of synchronised austerity will not only increase UK and EU unemployment and social dislocation and threaten a debt, another, another debt deflationary depression, they will also increase the public debt. And that's what's happening in Germany, for example. So I'll stop at that point. Thank you. Thank you.